you know, at this point, I'm going to trace back my steps, just uh, assuming nobody objects. I'm going to give another history over those same years in, those in the 70s, because this helps explain how the raft get out of the jam they're in, and also because it gives some context. So I'm going to talk about some other folks who are doing the same kind of thing in the same years, but who wanted to do it differently. And that is, I discussed at the beginning, there was like this sex, drugs, and rock and roll counterculture scene in West Berlin, and that the RAF were on the edges of that and thought they were more serious than that. Well, that counterculture is also developing political violence, and things are escalating at a more gradual, natural rate kind of thing. But you still have, by, you know, you know, by 1971-72, you still have things that escalate, because any time you have political violence, things escalate, because the state can escalate ad infinitum kind of thing. And so when the state does, you either have to escalate to or you have to back down. And so by 19, you know, by late, late 1971, there's a bunch of people in this counterculture scene. It was known as the blue scene in West Berlin. There's a bunch of people who are kind of hiding from the cops. And one of them, this guy George von Raus, he gets spotted by cops. And according to some reports, he goes for his gun. According to some reports, the cops go for their guns first. But the point of the matter is, they shoot him dead. Um, a bunch of his friends meet that night, and they're like, you know, we have to do something. You know, we can't continue. You know, they got to shoot us dead. We actually have to get serious. We have to be hiding more. We have to set up an actual guerrilla group. So they set up a guerrilla group, and they call their group the Second of June Movement. And the reason they picked that name, Second of June Movement, is... At the beginning, uh, I think maybe before some of you came in, I'd mentioned that there'd been a demonstration in 1967 where a kid at his first demo got shot through the head by an undercover police officer. And that demo happened on June 2nd. And so they call their group the June 2nd Movement because as they'll say later on, they want people to always, every time they mention them, to have to remember, you know, the government's the one who started, you know, the violence. They were just dealing with the situation that the government created. So they form a guerrilla group, and they have this idea they, they want to be different from the RAF. They want to be nicer. Uh, <laughs> they, they want to be more popular. You know, the RAF and the urban guerrilla concept have had this kind of like pessimistic view of West Germany. We can't get mass support. They, they held out hope for mass support. And they, you know, they also had more of an orientation, you know, in their minds towards the working class. They wanted regular people to be able to relate to them. So this is kind of like really important for them where they, when they start off. For all that, you know, their first actions kind of like could have been a RAF action. It's, uh, you know, Northern Ireland, a bunch of people gunned down by British paratroopers. It's known as Bloody Sunday at this peaceful demonstration. So 2nd of June movement in West Germany, they planned a bomb at the British Yacht Club. Only thing is, uh, you know, an old man at the yacht club finds the bomb and thinks he'll be able to defuse it. It was a horrible mistake. The bomb goes off. He's killed. So, you know, for all this wanting to be nicer and more accessible, you know, their first actions, you know... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, their next actions are more popular, though. They bomb police stations. They bomb schools for district attorneys. So people can relate to this kind of thing. Uh, they're also, in, you know, in 1974, they're the ones who try to kidnap that judge after that prisoner Holger Mainz dies on hunger strike, and they kill him when he resists. And, you know, folks in their scene don't really have a problem with this. Like, obviously, most people in West Germany have a problem, including definitely most working class people in West Germany. But, you know, again, they're, you know, they basically, when they say what they want to be popular, they're still not talking about everyone. They're still talking about a particular scene. Their next action's pretty controversial, to say the least, even in their chosen scene. And that is in, uh, also in 1974, they identify a kid who'd been close to them, who had been picked up by the cops, apparently, allegedly, planning an armed action, and he couldn't deal with the solitary confinement conditions that political prisoners had inflicted on them. So after a few months, he was like, I'll do anything to get out of prison, so, you know, there's something you can do, you can give information. So he's released on condition that he, get, that he snitches. And people kind of suspect him of this. Uh, so the 2nd of June movement 
pick him up, kidnap him, basically, and give him a trial. And he admits it, uh, at which point they kill him. So, you know, when this comes out, you know, it's, it just seems ugly. Like, I don't know, at the time, if people defended it, one day we hope to do a second legitimate book, and then I'll know all the details. But, you know, from what we hear, people just talk about this action as a really bad thing, kind of thing. Because you think one should not snitch, but once, you know, he was a kid in over his head, and once you do snitch and you've admitted that, well, the guy's admitted it. You can just publicize the fact that he's admitted it. Um, for the state, it also turns out not to be that great a thing, though, because when people do eventually one day go on trial for this, it turns out that the state had other undercover agents who were observing this trial from a distance kind of thing. So they didn't move in to save him. They kind of, like, watched as this happened. So, you know, it's not a win for, for their side either in terms of propaganda. That's still at least a bad taste in people's mouth. Their next action, however, is super popular. Uh, and that is in 1975, and you get a sense of maybe why the RAF thought these armed actions to free prisoners, they might work. The Second Agenda Movement, do, they succeed. In early 1975, just before Stockholm, they kidnap a guy running for mayor in West Berlin. He's running for the Christian Democrats, the right-wing party, it's the Social Democrats who hold the city government. They're suddenly in a real bind, because they can't say, you know, we're willing to die because we won't negotiate with terrorists, because it's not them who die, it's the guy running against them in an election. So it's like, Second Agenda Movement's also really smart. They only ask for prisoners who aren't facing murder charges and who are facing years, not decades, in prison. So the government actually, they blink. They, they give in. They release six prisoners who are, fly to South Yemen, go to these training camps of this group I mentioned, the PFLPEO, and from there they travel back mainly to West Germany to join guerrilla groups again. So they it's, flew them out of prison to get trained. <laughs> yeah, they flew them out of prison. Exactly. That's they flew them for a out of prison <laughs> to South Yemen. They go to these training camps and then they go back to Europe wow. um, to do stuff. Uh, demands. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, it's a super popular action. And it's even more popular once this guy, Peter Lorenz, this politician they've kidnapped, at the press conference, remember, they wanted to be nice gorillas. At the press conference, he's, they were really nice gorillas. They were like friendly, good conversation, they gave you good food. It's like, you know, so he's like basically talking about how nice these people are. You know, the cops actually think he was in on it. So they put a tail on him, but he wasn't in on it. He just had a relatively good experience and he was an oddball. So, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's the beginning of the end of the Second Agenda Movement because the cops aren't amused. They're out to get them. Over the next year, one of them's killed in a firefight. Most of them are arrested. 1976, some of them managed to break out of prison, but they, you know, it's still a very small group. And what you see is they start basically developing differences of opinion. Some of them think it's important to do things like they initially planned, be accessible, be popular, all of this. They call themselves social revolutionaries. Others think. No, even when we're popular, that doesn't stop us from being arrested or killed by the cops. Uh, so they're like, you know, we actually have to carry out heavier actions, forget about this trying to be popular kind of thing. They want to do things more like the RAF. So they call themselves anti-imperialists. So these two kind of like tendencies emerge. Uh, you know, they're... It's a very small group. Their next action is until 1977, after the RAF's disastrous debacle, uh, kidnapping Schleier, second to June movement kidnap a guy. And it works out swell, at least initially, because they get a ton of money. And they give some to the RAF people, they keep some for themselves, they give some to a Palestinian group. Uh, and the way they get this money is they don't let anyone know it's a political action. They just pretend to be kidnappers who want money, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> And it works um, initially. What doesn't work is this was a kidnapping in Austria. And to lay the groundwork for it, they get some kids who are doing political prisoner support work to help them. And although the guerrillas get away, the kids get identified by the cops afterwards. And they get picked up. And when I say kids, I think one of them was a teenager still. And like they can't deal with the situation. They have a really hard time in prison. And you know, some of them you know, end up giving information and whatnot. So it's, you know, it doesn't turn out super well. Uh, next, 
they break some, they try to break some people out of prison. They manage to break one of their guerrillas out of prison, but even that doesn't work out super well because this guy Till Meyer, he's just picked up by the cops a few weeks later, along with a bunch of the people who broke him out. So they're a really small group at this point, and they're kind of in crisis. At the same time, this late seventies is the Wrath is in crisis. Just to contextualize, everyone's in crisis late seventies. If you came out of the sixties, left. It's like. The women's movement can't decide whether or not to work with men or whether or not it's even a part of the left, so it's in crisis in West Germany. These Maoist parties, they're like hemorrhaging members to the Green Party kind of thing, so they're in crisis. Uh, it's kind of anti-authoritarian, anarchist kind of scene called the Spontis. Uh, you know, oh, the Rath had had a, a good relationship with, but they're in crisis by the late 70s because they can't deal with state repression. So everyone's in crisis. It's not just the guerrilla groups, but you know, it's up to the guerrilla groups to solve their problems. So they end up in Paris and the Second of June movement and the RAF, and they like talk to each other. And they're like, you know, what went wrong kind of thing. And by this point, you know, Almost, the RAF is fairly small by this point. It's maybe 20 people. It's still a lot bigger than the Second of June movement. And they, you know, they, they tried to assassinate Alexander Haig in 1979, but they failed uh, their first actions in 77. And they're in Paris, and they're, you know, roughly half of the group want to quit. They're like, we made a horrible mistake, you know. Lots of them had gone underground to try and free the prisoners in 77. It just hadn't worked out. And they're like, you know, We've thrown away our lives, you know, what what can we do now kind of thing. And, you know, the RAF has to be like robbing banks and getting money just to support these people because you can't just let them get picked up by the cops because they know all of this stuff. Um, so, you know, the second engine movement is talking to them, you know, before you know it, there's a raid on a safe house and almost all of the second engine movement is captured. There's only two people left at large, this woman Inga Fiat and this woman Julianne Clande. And they just say, look, can we join the RAF? You know, uh, they, they were like anti-imperialist. They wanted to do stuff more like the RAF already. They say, can we join? And what you have to understand is over the years, the RAF never publicly criticized or dissed the Second of June movement or other guerrillas. It just wasn't up to them to do. They were like the big fish in the pond. What? They don't have to like diss these other groups. The Second of June movement, however, had repeatedly, publicly, and that's public political statements, attacked the RAF, saying you're authoritarian, you're hierarchical, your strategy won't work. Uh, but by 1980, it seemed like the Second of June movement strategy was the strategy that hadn't worked. So the RAF turned around and said, yeah, you can join. You have to publicly disband the organization. Uh, so everyone knows that's the end of the Second of June movement. And you also have to publicly say, we were right and you were wrong kind of thing. Uh, you know, in, in the lexicon of the day, it was called like a self-criticism. So, uh, so they agree to this. And, you know, it's an ugly little document. It's in our second volume. And, you know, in it, they crap all over their history. They, in this psychedelic move, they take the Lorenz kidnapping, which freed prisoners, and the Schleier kidnapping, which didn't. And they say the Schleier kidnapping was the much better political action because it forced the state kind of thing to show its ugly face, whereas with the Lorenz kidnapping, the state freed prisoners, so it felt, you know, it, it's just craziness. Uh, and, you know, the social revolutionary members of the Second of June movement, they're all prisoners. They're not on the streets. They can't do anything, but they're really, like, upset, you know, at the statement. So they, like, denounce it. We include their denunciation, which is actually a really good document in our second volume. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Second of June movement doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Inga Fiat and Julian Planbeck are now with the RAF. Doesn't turn out too great for them. Julian Planbeck dies in a traffic accident a few weeks later. Now it's only Inga Fiat. So it's a really disingenuous, like disbanding of a political organization if you end up being one person who's... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but she brings with her a resource which gets the RAF out of its jam, which is that years earlier, Inga Fiat had met and evidently hit it off with this high-level member of the East German secret police, the Stasi. And, you know, this wasn't a nice secret police force. It was kind of like the FBI's worst crimes on a mass scale kind of thing. But, you know, East Germany was opposed to West Germany, and he did manage to get her out of a jam a few times in East Bloc countries. So, you know, 
she reaches out to him in uh, 1980, and she says, you know, it's to see if I'm with the wrath now, and we have a problem. There's all of these people who want to leave. We don't know what to do. And so she presents him, you know, the Stasi, with the Raf's proposal, which is East Germany had really positive relationship with national liberation movements around the world. And the Raf's proposal was, could you set us up with one of the national liberation movements in Africa, and we'll just send the people who want to quit there. And they can work with that movement, they can support that movement, either non-violently or violently. However, that's up to them to figure out, but, you know, our problem will be solved. And this guy, uh, Harry Dahl, this guy, Stasi official, he turns around and just says, like, this is a horrible idea. It's like, you know, these are like the most wanted guerrillas kind of thing in Western Europe. You know, you really got to jam up some movement if they get caught sheltering these people. Not to mention the fact, all these people are white, and you got to, like, stick them with an African national liberation movement. they got to get noticed really soon, you know, and they'll all be caught. Uh, it'll be a disaster. So he turns around, he, he gives a counter proposal, which is, he says, we'll take him. You know, East Germans are Germans, West Germans are Germans, they can come to East Germany. The condition is they never do anything messed up like with the RAF ever again. They have no contact to any political organizations, you know, in West Germany or anything like that. They live conservative lives. And when the RAF hear this, they're like overjoyed. And because it solves their problem, and basically half of their group almost get sent to East Germany. And the Stasi, they're good to their word. They train them, they scatter them throughout the country with new identities, and these people live very conservative lives. Uh, you know, until the Berlin Wall comes down when they're all arrested. But you know, <laughs> one couldn't see that coming. And uh, and you know. In their memoirs, some of them say that they had a horrible time in East Germany, but many of them say these were the nicest years of their life, you know, because uh, they had kind of weird, weird lives, you know, uh, and they got to relax. Um, the RAF's problem solved, right? Everyone in the RAF is now down with the program. And they look around, and, you know, there's two ways of explaining what comes next, and we definitely have decided who we believe, we basically believe former RAF members. Uh, and the way we explain what happens next is they look around and they want to reach out to the radical left. And that explains what happens next. Lots of people on the left disagree with us, us being me and my co-editor of these two histories of the RAF, and lots of people on the left say, uh, no, the Stasi told them to do it, that they had relations with the Stasi during this period. For a few years, it's true, they can go to East Germany occasionally and relax. On a couple of famous occasions, they were allowed to fire weapons at a military range. Once even they got to fire a missile launcher, which was like really exciting and everything. But it's, uh, you know, we don't think the Stasi was calling the shots. Uh, what we think is they want to reach out to the left. And when they looked around at the left in 1980, 81, like I said, the left of their generation was in crisis, wasn't going great. The Green Party was the, the next big thing, and this isn't where the RAF was at. But what they did see is they saw a radical youth movement had come out of the anti-nuclear movement in West Germany in the mid-70s. And they started by rioting against nuclear power plants. Uh, by the late 70s, they were rioting against military uh, ceremonies or whatnot. And then, you know, by the early 80s, they were squatting solid city blocks of, of like, apartment buildings even. Like, hundreds of people would live in these squats. They'd, have squat with cinemas, bars, the whole thing, and they defend these squats with barricades and Molotov cocktails against the cops. So this movement was called the Autonomen, or Autonomists, and we feel it's fairly clear that the RAF, you know, were enthusiastic about this and thought, you know, let's see if we can reach out. And, you know, the reaching out, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just list what happened. In 1981, there's a prisoner's hunger strike, which is always a good way of getting people to talk about prison conditions, why people are in prison, their politics. A prisoner dies on hunger strike, his name is Sigurd de Boos. This is obviously a really horrible thing and a tragedy, but also makes it really clear what the stakes are. Uh, you start to see amongst the autonomen, you know, from the outside they'll look the same, they'll dress the same, they'll live in the same squats, they'll be a part of the same black blocks, but within the scene there's a difference and some people start to adopt, most autonomen are anti-RAF, they think, you know, 
we don't think the prisoners should be tortured, but we think the RAF are authoritarian or Marxist Leninist, or we don't understand their long communiques or whatever. But you have a smaller, much smaller group of people who start to say, we actually like the RAF. Uh, we approve of their politics, and these people call themselves anti-imperialists, or more colloquially, they refer to themselves as anti-imps, uh, which always sounds cool in English. So <laughs> you have an anti-imp scene developing. And again, from the outside, they look just like autonomen. They seem interchangeable. But you know, if you were an anti-imp, that was a different thing. Um, the next thing the RAF do is the RAF carry out two attacks in 1981. They bomb a US military base, and they try to assassinate a US general who's also a high-level NATO official. And in their communiques for these attacks, they don't talk about prisoners. It's like the prisoners are no longer on the radar uh, as far as these communiques are concerned. They just talk about war against NATO. We need a war against NATO. And you have to understand the largest mass movement in West Germany at that time was the movement against stationing NATO short-range nuclear missiles in West Germany. And lots of these autonomous and anti-imps were involved in that movement. So, it was a process of reaching out, and the RAF make this official, if you will, in 1982. They released their first big political document in a decade. It's called uh, The Guerrilla, the Resistance, and the Anti-Imperialist Front, or the Front Paper, or the May Paper, because it came out in May. And in it, what they say is, imperialism is weak. Uh, it can be defeated relatively easily, uh, even though it mainly hurts people in the third world, a successful upsurge against it anywhere, even in West Germany, can throw it into crisis. And what's more, they say, they think the above ground left, by which they mean anti-imps, autonomous, has a really important role to play in this. So, you know, in 1982, if you're an anti-imp, the most famous guerrillas in your universe have just said you can defeat imperialism around the world. Uh, and what's more, they want to work with you to do this. So it's, you know, exciting. Uh, they follow the, you know, the autonomous and by and large aren't that impressed. Like I said, they, they are already kind of skeptical of the RAF, but the anti you know, it's, it's inspiring. And the RAF followed this up with two years of meeting with people, which is difficult, you know, at this point. Their cops are looking from everywhere. But they figure it out how to meet, where to meet, and they talk to people, and it's basically, you know, have you read the May paper? Have you read our front paper? What do you think? Can you work with us? Uh, how, how do you imagine working with us and all of this? They go out of the country. They talk to other people about this. We don't know exactly what they had planned next, because before they could do what they would have had planned next, they encounter a really big military defeat, which is in the summer of 1984, RAF members are staying in a safe house in Frankfurt, RAF member is cleaning a gun, they take the clip out of the gun, but they forget a bullet in the chamber, and the gun goes off. And they've shot through the floor. I say it's a safe house, but it's an apartment in an apartment building, they're not in the basement, so they've just shot through someone else's apartment, potentially, so it's like, what to do? One of them goes downstairs, she figures out what apartment it probably was, she knocks on the door, a guy comes to the door, and she says, you know, hi, you don't know me. I'm cat sitting for the people upstairs. I've knocked over a bunch of water on the floor. I'm really sorry. I'm afraid it might be leaking into your apartment. Uh, you know, I'm just here to check. Is everything okay? And the guy says, yeah, everything's fine. Uh, I, I, don't, I haven't noticed anything. So she says, thank you. Sorry for bothering you. See you later. Closes the door. Goes back upstairs. Uh, the guy closes the door and he's like, wait a second. I've been watching football on TV. I wouldn't know if water was leaking, I'd better check. So he goes around from one room to another, and in the bathroom, he notices, you know, a hole in the ceiling. And then, what's that? There's a bullet in the bathtub. So he phones the cops, and every single RAF member was in that safe house. And every single, yeah, every single RAF member was captured, uh, you know, it's nice to say that like military successes or defeats are what counts as the political consequences for a group. You know, the military is always mediated politically, but no matter how smart you are politically, normally you don't get over having everyone in prison. It's normally the end. Um, but the RAF were in 
a really unusual position that they've just spent two years talking to people. Two years saying, can we work together? How can you work with us? So they were like in this really uniquely bizarre situation that they were actually able to overcome the setback. According to like some stories, which you know we don't know if they're true or not, there was an anti-imp staying in the safe house by the name of Ava Hala, who wasn't arrested simply because she was out buying groceries at the time. Whether or not that's true, we don't know, but we do know that Ava Hala and other anti imps went underground that summer with a goal of continuing what the RAF had planned. They rob a gun store in November, then in December, it could have been, a, you know, it's almost like a signal or whatever, prisoners go on hunger strike. And in their hunger strike statement, they hardly talk about prison conditions, mainly what they talk about, you know, it could have been the May paper part two. They talk about the war against NATO. We need a war against NATO, and NATO's the main enemy in all of this. A few days later, the RAF plant a car bomb on a school for NATO officers, like not for little kids, but for like, you know, military personnel in NATO. Uh, the car is identified by a guard at the school <coughs> and the bomb is diffused before it goes off. So, but this makes headlines too and that's almost like a second signal because suddenly in West Berlin and across West Germany, people start blowing stuff up and burning stuff down. Uh, all of these attacks, they're carried out by things that's, you know, first time anyone's ever seen this, they're called fighting units. It's, Comes very clear fairly quickly. Fighting units are anti imps carrying out attacks against military industrial complex type of targets in which they try not to hurt anyone, they just try to do property damage. And the only person the fighting units will actually kill during their part of this offensive is a young anti imp who blows himself up while planting a bomb. Um, the fighting units over the next two months carry out, on average, one attack every single day. So it's like there's nothing like this that's been seen before. It's like a high point. And, you know, the irony is the movie about the wrath, Stefan Elst's book, Julian Becker's book, all this, it stops in 1977. Like, according to all of these accounts, the wrath story ends with the Stamheim death. So this stuff just didn't happen. But, you know, from what we can see, this stuff is actually super interesting and super important and, you know, politi to politically think about this kind of thing. Uh, in mid-January, while all of this is going on in West Germany, a French general is on his way home, you know, from work. His name is René Audran. His job is to sell weapons on behalf of France to governments around the world. France at the time was the third largest supplier of military weapons in the world after the United States and the Soviet Union. René Audran gets out of his car, he's shot dead. A French guerrilla group called Action Direct release a communique in which they say, we're doing this as part of a war against NATO too. We're in a front with the RAF. So suddenly you've got this front fighting units in the RAF, you've got this front action direct in the RAF, and then a few days later the RAF go into action. They enter the home of this guy. He was a high-level corporate official in this company that makes parts for tanks and fighter aircraft for NATO. They tie up his wife in one room, they bring him to another room, and they shoot him through the head. Uh, their document is the same thing. We're at war against NATO, you know, the front is, you know, shaking the foundations of imperialism or something like that kind of thing. It's, you know, in this context, the RAF prisoners release a statement. They say, folks are dying. We don't think the government's going to care if we die, so we're going to start eating. But, they say, we're really happy with what we see. This is like a breakthrough. <laughs> uh, we've been waiting for something like this. You know, this is great. So it's like, in terms of the RAF's history, I feel late 84, late 85, is like they, they've reinvented a support base in the early 80s, and then they've gotten that support base to basically act within their strategic framework. And so this is like an incredible success. But the flip side to this thing that like successes or failures are always mediated politically, like, you know, if you play your cards right politically, you can make up for setbacks. You know, the corollary is if you play your cards wrong, you can really just destroy everything you've done. And we see that next in 1985, because the RAF's next action, you know, will really, you know, it, it's the end of the front pretty much. And what it is, is they bomb another US air base. And again, people die, and again, that was foreseeable. And again, as far as like the radical left is concerned, that's fine, you know? It's nothing personal. It's like, you know, it's 
But if you approve of bombing military bases, well, in that case, people on a military base, it's unfortunate, but occasionally they'll be hurt. Um, people obviously feel really differently, though, when it's announced a few days later by the cops that a soldier was found killed in the woods. And, you know, the, the cops are saying the RAF did this to get his ID to, you know, do their air base action. Uh, and, you know, a friend of mine, you know, goes to the Antium squad and the Antiums tell him, CIA fabrication. Wouldn't have been the RAF. RAF don't do that kind of thing. You know, picking up random GIs and killing them kind of thing. Uh, but when my friend went back to that squad a few days later, it's like the Antium's tune had changed because the RAF had come out with a statement and they said, yeah, we killed them. We don't see what the problem is. We're at war against NATO. He's a U.S. soldier. You know, what did you expect? Uh, there's a wave of, like, I don't know what people here think about this, and I've given this talk at this point like a lot of times over the past few weeks, and different people feel differently kind of thing. But clearly at the time, even within the radical left, which was willing to approve of or view like the RAF as comrades, people were unhappy with this. There's like a wave of disgust. Uh, you have to understand, like this soldier, he was like, you know, a teenager, I think. You know, he was possibly away from home for the first time. He wasn't on the military base. He was in a bar drinking. Uh, this woman comes up to him and starts flirting with him. He flirts back. One thing leads to another. You know, do you want to leave with me? He leaves with her. She's a RAF member. He's dead in the woods. It's like, it just seemed really ugly and also really unnecessary because once you have him in the woods, why not, you know, just tie him up and, like, take his ID kind of thing. Uh, you know, the RAF respond to this criticism. Uh, they release a statement in which they say, these are their words, if we made a mistake, our mistake was not realizing how many assholes there were on the left um, who would use this, yeah, as an opportunity to distance themselves from us. So it's like, you know, not the way to win friends yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and the criticism continues, and the RAF release more documents, and finally they apologize, basically, and they say, we made a mistake. Uh, but by that point, the damage is done. They've lost all of the support that this wonderful offensive in early 85, you know, had, had generated. And, you know, the state, which always knows how to, when to time these things, you know, carry out a number of raids and arrest a bunch of people and accuse them of carrying out those fighting unit attacks. So the front is really broken. You know, the fighting units attacks peter out, and the front is really no more of that. And the RAF at that point transform themselves. And they become, you know, a lean, mean killing machine. They'll, uh, every six or seven months, every year or so, someone will die. Some civil servant, some bureaucrat, some politician. And then the RAF will release a document explaining who the person was and why they died. And, you know, this wasn't Henry Kissinger, this wasn't George Bush Jr., these weren't people who everyone hated kind of thing. These were often people that people on the radical left didn't even understand why they were being targeted. Uh, you know, one can say that this is an ethically more clean practice because it wasn't random people walking on an airbase who'd be hurt. These were the targets and their bodyguards and occasionally their chauffeurs were at risk. And that was it. Uh, that's not a way to build a movement, right? Uh, and like, I don't know, you know, if anyone here was in Germany in the late 80s, but often people are at these talks, people come to these talks, they were politically active, often on the radical left in the late 80s, and almost without exception, they hated the RAF. They like considered the RAF to be just bad news, giving the radical left a bad name. And these were often people who approved of armed actions, like approved of other guerrilla groups' actions, but the RAF just seemed no one understood what they were doing. And even the prisoners clearly weren't that impressed, because in 1989, the prisoners go on hunger strike, and for the first time ever, they let it be known they don't want the RAF carrying out any attacks during their hunger strike. So it's like, like in terms, you know, it's, it's not, you know, the RAF is kind of flailing. And 1989 is also the year the Berlin Wall comes down. So all those former RAF people in East Germany are now arrested. And, you know, 
living conservative lives for several years may have rubbed off, off on them, or maybe it's just that they had really disapproved of the RAF when they left, but they all agree to testify. In, in one case, even, they're not facing criminal charges themselves, and they offer to testify against uh, RAF prisoners who are, have already been in prison for years. So you have this spectacle of RAF prisoners getting added years to their sentences. Um, 1989 is also, you know, New World Order, end of history, redrawn borders every day. East Germany is no more, it just becomes absorbed into this new creature, Germany, which hasn't existed since the Nazi era. And, you know, they've been doing opinion polls for years, and the only people in West Germany who thought reunification was either realistic or worth fighting for was like the far, far right. It's like this wasn't a mainstream political objective, then suddenly it happens overnight. And everyone in West Germany seems super happy about it. So it's like, if you were on the radical left, it's like a complete game changer. And you feel super isolated, super demoralized, super confused. And the RAF kind of putter on with these assassinations for a couple of years, but they clearly, you know, they recognize that, you know, it's not getting them anywhere. Uh, and then two things happen that really change things. One is a liberal wing of the government get in charge of, basically in charge of like prison conditions and things like that. Uh, the Minister of the Interior, like all of this kind of thing, and the Attorney General and all of this kind of thing, they let it be known that, you know, if you're a RAF prisoner, and it doesn't matter if you, how much you have left on your sentence, if you're really sick or if you're willing to show remorse, you can expect you might get out of prison pretty soon. So it's like, you know, a few months later, the RAF released a document, and they say it's not a reaction to the government, that they've been working on it beforehand, but in their document, they basically say, look, we're not going to kill anyone anymore. Uh, we've got to do stuff, but we're not going to kill people because we recognize that the left needs space to talk about the changes in the world, and the left can't have that space as long as we're assassinating folks. So. You know, a few days later, the prisoners release a statement in which they say, we're so happy you're not going to be killing anyone anymore. Thank you. We, we, you know, we agree completely. You know, stop killing people. We approve. Um, I was like, you know, the RAF and the government were kind of like a train going super, super fast. This was like slamming on the brakes. So things don't always work out super smoothly. So the prisoners aren't for the most part, in super isolation at this point, but they don't have free contact with one another. And, you know, there's a really high stakes game kind of thing, you know, this de-escalation. And there's large parts of the state which have like a personal interest, but they don't, you know, they don't like the fact that they need to have a bodyguard every time they go for a walk around the block kind of thing. So lots of players and some of the prisoners start having misgivings because they're like, you know, I'm not going to show remorse, I'm not remorseful. I, I agree with what we did, so I guess I'm not getting out. And they start wondering at this process going on and having second thoughts. And this comes to a head the next year. The RAF carry out what will be their final action. They bomb a prison. It's a prison that's about to be opened. There's no prisoners in it. They tie up the security guards, because remember, they don't want to hurt anyone. A cute detail, you know, that like warning construction work in progress sticker tape, they have like special sticker tape made, warning, wrath bombing in progress. <laughs> and they put it around the prison and they plant so much dynamite, like the prison's like total. It takes like years to be rebuilt. So you know, if you're on the left, it's a super cool action. It's like people like this action. Uh, but again, you know, context being everything, some of those prisoners who are like, we're not gonna show remorse, they're like, you know, thinking to themselves, this isn't the standard RAF action. We don't really understand, you know, is the RAF just trying to be popular kind of thing? Or is the RAF trying to somehow, is this some weird negotiation with the government? Like, we'll do a bombing to pressure you to, like, people have these misgivings. It all comes out after what happens next. But the government moves in. And it plays, like, its final card. In the situation that, on the left, everyone's confused and demoralized for the first time ever, the government gets an agent close to the RAF. And this government sets up a meeting. Two RAF members go to this train station in this town called Bad Kleinen. Suddenly they're surrounded by members of this like anti-terrorist unit, GSG-9. Uh, one of them, Birgit Hogefeld's 
captured on the spot. The other one, Wolfgang grabs, he draws his gun, he shoots an agent, he makes a break for it. Nevertheless, he's like cornered, he's captured, he's thrown to the ground, handcuffed. And according to eyewitnesses who live in the area, so not people on the left or anything like that, an agent goes over to him and shoots him through the head. So it's like, you know, 10 years earlier, people would have joined the RAF as a result of this. But, you know, not in the 90s, because it was just clear it was a group without a future. And in this context, pretty soon, you know, the, the RAF prisoners who were having those misgivings, most of the RAF prisoners <laughs> publicly denounced the RAF. And they basically say the RAF is confused, the RAF, you know, the prison bombing was a confused action. You're obviously confused if you allowed an agent to get close to you. And what's more, we suspect the wrath of cooperating with some prisoners to cut a deal with the government to get prisoners out of prison. And even though these people were prisoners who'd been in prison for like, you know, years or decades, they, they just weren't, they didn't approve of anything like that. So they denounced the wrath. Um, at which point the wrath is kind of finished. Um, they'll release documents throughout the 90s in which they'll kind of like talk about their past, try to justify themselves. It's almost like, why doesn't anyone like us kind of thing. Uh, and then there's silence. And then in 1998, a mainstream publication, you know, out of the blue, receives for the first time in years, there's a document from the RAF entitled The Urban Guerrilla in the Form of the Red Army Faction is Now History. They go over everything that was ever done by the RAF. They go over all of this, they end up with a list of everyone from any guerrilla group who ever died uh, in West Germany. And then three lines from a poem by Rosa Luxemburg, uh, I was, I am, I will be again. And then that's it for the RAF. It's, uh, there's still, according to the government, a few people at large, you know, their wanted posters are still up with their faces. Some of their DNA was found at the site of an armored truck robbery in, uh, in the 90s, so they were like preparing the retirement fund. Uh, the, like the RAF managed to renew their tradition, like repeatedly, they basically created their tradition. Uh, but everything changed so much with the Berlin Wall coming down, and everything was so different in the 90s, that at that point the tradition really ceases to exist in any meaningful way, like, you know. And, but for all that, you know, it's not a win for the state. You know, it's not the state that beat the RAF, it's the, it's the RAF that de-escalated. Uh, you know, it can be argued that the state basically, out of fear, agreed to release prisoners decades before they would have gotten out otherwise. And it's the RAF that chose to dip, disband itself eventually. And the state does, still doesn't know who did what. So you have this, like, obscene situation. A few years ago, this former RAF prisoner was dying of cancer. And, you know, the government said, we're going to send you back to prison if you don't say who killed Siegfried Buback. Uh, even though they'd already locked up this other RAF member for 20 years for killing Siegfried Buback, they knew he wasn't the one who killed him, kind of thing. So this woman, Krista X, she refused, and there was outcry, so she wasn't sent back to prison. But, like, for the state, it's, it's not clear when it either. But uh, that's the very long story. So thank you for all sitting through it. Uh, and yeah, if, if folks want to discuss or questions or reactions, or there was another guerrilla group, also revolutionary cells, but at this point it feels like sadism to like go over their <laughs> history. <laughs> like, you know, folks have stuff to say or stuff to ask. Well, well, well thanks a lot. I mean, this really. I just want to respect time. It's 9 11. We should try to end around 9, and we got started late tonight. So if people would like to stay and have a conversation for the next 15, 20 minutes. We can do that. Um, if people need to go, please uh, do what you need to do. Um, so yeah, questions? I, yes. um, what was the connection between the RAF and any organizations that were operating in the 70s uh, in the US? Um, I think the only real relationship would have been goodwill, you know. Uh, there was no organizational connection. Uh, definitely the people doing RAF prisoner support work also did support work, for instance, for like in the very early 70s for Angela Davis, later on in the 70s for other political prisoners in the United States. 
when the RAF prisoners died in 1977, there was a group called the uh, Sam Melville Jonathan Jackson unit on the West Coast, which bombed a German car company's offices. Uh, but you know that was just goodwill. There was no real connection beyond that. Um, yeah. Or oh. Ireland. Was, was there any connection with people? Definitely went to Ireland. Uh, I, you know, and I don't, you know, the we don't know if there was any connection, but that kind of connection is far more possible that that existed. Uh, also, because people from, you know, various other guerrilla groups in Western Europe would end up at those, both at those same training camps in the Middle East. So people could meet there. So there was networking going on in that sense. Informal, I think. Informal. But uh, but yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that there was probably some some contact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, having um, researched all this and got to know the story and everything for you all, what would what would you say uh, as far as movement building? and having an influence from the left, uh, what is the most important lesson to be learned um, from all yeah. of that for today and up and coming activism? Well, I think there's two lessons. Uh, one of which is that, you know, it's, it's a lesson that, uh, you know, to me it's an optimistic lesson, but it's a lesson people often like don't, don't want to hear is that the RAF basically proved that you can act in a way that everyone thinks you're really crazy when you start kind of thing and you have like people just think you know these actions are nuts kind of thing but if you manage to do them I'm not only talking about armed actions I'm talking about any kind of position you can stake out a position that's really extreme seems really out there no one's agreeing with you or it seems no one's agreeing with you but if you're consistent and if you act in a principled way and if you defend that position you'll end up creating political space, uh, both for people to agree with you and also for a whole bunch of other positions close to you. I think it's definitely, if there'd been, without the wrath within West Germany, people would have seen the 2nd of June movement and other guerrilla groups in a much more negative light. But these other guerrilla groups got to look like the nice guerrillas because you had the wrath doing these really heavy actions and letting it be known that they weren't gonna pull their punches. Um, the other lesson though, uh, which kind of like qualifies that first lesson, is that when carrying out any action, even a military action kind of thing, the political is always more important. So it's really the, the political consequences of an action. Like, you know, we often hear even today, you know, that the police smashed a demonstration or that a lot of people got arrested at a demonstration. Or you'll hear in terms of the Black Bloc, you'll hear that the Black Bloc did things and really alienated people. But I think the lesson even though it's a completely different context, the lesson from something like the wrath is what actually counts isn't that. What counts is what happens afterwards. It's are there people willing to go out there and explain, you know, why the black bloc broke some windows, or are there people willing to go out there and basically, you know, capitalize on, like, not be intimidated by police violence, but kind of like use it to teach people, you know, because there's some people who have no choice, but who deal with much heavier police violence than the radical left does every single day in North America kind of thing. So, you know, in a sense, we can look at that, you know. So I want to ask you, uh, addressing that way, yeah. uh, just uh, what out of everything had been uh, the best fruitation of everything? Of the wrath? Yeah. Uh, I think definitely 1972 and, you know, the, I feel 1972 and the, uh, the attempt to build a front, like starting with the stuff that happened in 1981 and then the pa position paper in 1982 and the years of discussions, each time uh, they really seem to create a lot of political space. And, you know, uh, each time, unfortunately, subsequent errors just you know, undid that, but I think that, you know, those were really successful. Uh, you know, staking out extreme, maybe unpopular positions, but then explaining them, finding who could support them and all of that. It's, uh, it's what makes the RAF really interesting um, because, you know, 1972 or the 84 arrests, in both of those cases, 
you know, most organizations would have ended, but they managed to actually keep going. Yeah. Oh, did you really? Go first. Well, the, this is really interesting because I'm just thinking about all this comparative stuff. Um, I read Anne Hansen's Direct Action, uh, Urban Gorilla in Canada, and I think she actually went over to Germany and hung out with the Autonomen at one point. Wait, what? Is, how do you pronounce it again? Uh, autonomous or Autonomen or Autonomen. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. <laughs> I think that was right. And um, her, I really recommend her book. I mean, it's a really fascinating look at like the life of everyday life of an urban gorilla. Um, and some people would say that she was she and, and the Squamish Five are kind of the, the the precursor to the Earth Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Front, front right. and that they targeted like large scale industrial projects. They didn't want to hurt people. They had a sort of ecological and animal related. Uh, relational idea about how things could be and um, and it's just uh, it, it's just interesting to hear the history of RAF and then see how property damage in North America is equated at times with terrorism yeah uh, especially with like Earth Liberation Front and Liberation Front actions um, and I was wondering if, if you as a Canadian or maybe not I don't know how you're identifying nationally. That's that's cool. Um, but somebody from the from that area, you know, if you have any thoughts about Anne and that group of urban gorillas and how it relates to RAF. Or well, definitely. I mean, that's actually a really, uh, yeah, useful thing to think about. Uh, like, definitely, I'm of a generation. Uh, I was. I don't know. I must have been like twelve or thirteen when it was announced on the radio that this group calling itself Direct Action. Had blown up a lithium power plant. Uh, no power plant, a lithium uh, arms yeah, manufacturing. Yeah, manufacturing right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, over, like, the Squamish Five were based in Vancouver, and from everything I've heard, they were a disaster for the Vancouver scene, because the <laughs> Vancouver scene couldn't cope with the repression, and just really yeah. was decimated. But they were, for people of my generation, if people were teenagers when they carried out those attacks, or when they were in prison, we were radicalized by them. Like, you know, it, it's quite possible that I wouldn't have ended up doing this kind of like research or being interested in this if not for them. Uh, and, you know, definitely this is true, I know of like many, many other people. And within Canada, and, you know, I think maybe this is uh, location centric of me kind of thing, but I kind of get the impression that Canada had an influence on North America in the sense, I think the fact that at the anarchist movement in Canada, uh, non-sectarian support for political prisoners is such a big part of the anarchist movement in Canada, is because the Squamish Five were basically anarchist political prisoners. And through that, people started doing political prisoner support work, then they got in touch with like people like Quasi Balagoon here in New York State, and people like David Gilbert and so on, and it just, you know, it just created a really useful Thing. So definitely, yeah, the, the Squamish Five, the Vancouver Five, they're like, I feel they're a part of that, but like you say, they tried not to hurt anyone, you know, and groups like the ELF try not to hurt anyone and by and large don't hurt anyone, and they end up with prison sentences, you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah, huge, yeah. and uh, I just, you know, I think that definitely creates a different political situation than the RAF people we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Uh, or than West Germans in general we're dealing with. I mean, it kind of begs the question, if you're going to give somebody, you know, for all intents and purposes, a life sentence for what's a non-violent crime, you're, the state is kind of sacrificing one of its weapons to convince people not to carry out violent crimes. Right. And, you know, uh, I think it's just the fact that, you know, this is such a surveillance society, and technology actually makes it so much more difficult to carry out those higher level actions uh, is the only thing really stopping them from occurring. Um, I, I was just curious, um, it, it sounds like one of the, the critiques during RAF's, you know, involvement with the radical left was, was this authoritarianism, yeah. and, and, and that there were a number of actions where not everybody agreed, like the hijacking. Right. Um, and like, if in your research you found like what was the process for making decisions 
and or was it like just a couple strong people that um, sort of the ring leaders? Um, but then at one point you also said that they didn't like that term right. because they also sort of enjoyed this idea of not having a leader. Yeah. yeah. Our impression is that the former RAF members are probably wisely fairly tight-lipped about their internal process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's all kinds of both political and possible legal ramifications to saying so-and-so decided this or whatnot. Um, but, my... Well, that alone says a lot, though, right? Right. I mean, that so, speaks, speaks to what they had going on, I would think. Yeah, I mean... That's, my, I mean, it's pretty savvy. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. And my impression, again, I could be wrong, and it could have also changed with time, but my impression is that decisions were largely made by consensus. But, you know, consensus can be a very authoritarian way of making decisions if there's, like you said, one or two strong personalities and no one wants to be the one disagreeing with them. But it can also be a really good way. So I don't know how it played out. Like, you'll often have them describe that you had these long meetings that would go on until everyone agreed. Well... No, depending on your own political experiences, that can sound really good or really bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes like, it just so, gets so late, you're like, fine, whatever exactly. you guys want to do. Yeah. So I don't know for them how it worked, but uh, I think a part of the charge of authoritarianism is when you're willing to stake out a position and do things, and do things knowing it's got to have massive ramifications mm -hmm. for the rest of the left, and do them saying, we don't care. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Our reference point is, as it was in the 70s, people in the third world kind of thing. So the West German left may hate the fact that we're doing this stuff, not got to from doing it. I think that made people think they were authoritarian. Mm -hmm. and I think also the fact that they got so much heavier repression. So let's say you were an anti-imp. So you're not a member of the RAF, but the people supporting the RAF, or who'd be identified within the radical scene as pro-RAF people, you know, when you're when you're the ones dealing with the heaviest repression, I think it makes you act in a way that you may not realize it, but you may really come off as arrogant to other people or as authoritarian, just because you're like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not dealing with what we're dealing with. So I could see that that could have probably been a part of the process. But you know, to explain that was like a real dynamic. There were anti imps who got years in prison for, you know, what would be considered in any other West European country or North America to be completely legal activities. People would get a year in prison for handing out a flyer around prison conditions. Uh, you know, there was somebody who was caught graffitiing, he'd done a red star. And so on top of the graffiti charge, he got support for terrorism charge because the mm -hmm. judge said, we know that after a red star, you would have written RAF kind of thing. Oh, so, you know, yeah. you can get two years in prison for that. So it's like, you know, so these anti imps they weren't making, you know, they weren't imagining the fact that they were dealing with this heavy situation. Uh, but I could have, I, I can imagine that it could have made them act in a way that other people would have thought, you know, they weren't nice. Like I was Facebook chatting with an American leftist who spent several years in West Germany at the time. He had nothing good to say about the anti imps He said, you know, they, they'd show up like, dressed like bikers, they acted like gangsters, yeah. they didn't care what we were, you know, we'd tell them things were bad for the left, what they were doing, they wouldn't care. And So some people evidently experienced it that way. So I doubt the anti-imps intended, mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. come off like that. But yeah. Like, I'm thinking of, like, the Zapatistas, too, coming out in 94 as an armed right. sort of revolutionary grouping, and then giving up those arms in, you know, uh, 99, 2000. And I guess I'm wondering, like, did, did RAF have any influence on them or any other, like, really well-known organizations around 